This morning, as we begin, we're going to take a moment to talk about God and the follower of Jesus. And before we move forward, I want us to reflect on what we have seen that God has and is and will do for the follower of Jesus according to Romans 8, 28 through 30, what we saw last week. We saw that he, he works all things out for the good of those who loved him and are called according to his purpose. That he has called and predestined them to be his, right? That he has, he has justified them, that he is sanctifying them, that he will glorify them. But then Paul moves forward. And in light of the, that, he says, asks this question. Who can be against us? Now, he says something else. So let's look at Romans 8.31. Shall we? Turn in your Bibles to Romans 8.31. And we'll put ourselves into context. So let's start at verse 28. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. Brothers, sorry, And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. And Paul then just gets amazed then what are we to say about these things? Because these are pretty amazing things. If God is for us, who is against us? If God is for us, who is against us? Now, that's quite a statement, right? Who can be against us? Now, Paul is not saying that no one opposes us. He's not saying, now, the world opposes us, right? He knows that. Our, our flesh opposes us. He's even said that in the book of Romans. The, Satan opposes us. Death, false teachers. So he's not saying that we don't face opposition. But in light, of, uh, in light of the fact that God is for us, what really stands in our way? If God is for us, what can really stand against us? Nothing. This is Paul's point. When we have God on our side, what can stop us? Period. That's the point. The ultimate stopping. Now, think about this. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul is talking to the Thessalonians. And this is an amazing statement. Paul is saying, I've been trying to get to you. I've been trying to come to you. And I was stopped. This is Paul. The same Paul that's talking to the Romans. Saying to, to the Romans, if God is for us, who can be against us? And Paul is saying now to the Thessalonians, I was trying to get you, but I was stopped. Wait a minute, Paul. What's going on? How can you say to the Romans, if God's for me, who can be against me? But say to the Thessalonians, I was trying to get to you, but I was stopped. Well, this is that ultimate thing, isn't it? This is the point. God is for us. But it's that ultimate good, isn't it? Is that remembering what Romans 8.28 was about. Remembering that God has an ultimate purpose in mind, right? Remembering what we talked about last week, where God's purpose doesn't always make sense to us in that moment, right? In that moment, we may think that this is the goal. And Paul thought, when he's talking to the Thessalonians, that it's the goal that I need to get to the Thessalonian church right now. Remember where uh, we talked about Joseph, and Joseph got sold into slavery. Well, that wasn't a good thing 
in and of itself, right? It's never a good thing to be sold into slavery. But God used that, intended that for good. That's what Genesis 50 verse 20 told us. So God took a wicked thing, intended it for good. So if God is for us, who can be against us? Even that which is evil, even that which is wicked, cannot stop that which is good. What he is saying, what he is saying is that because God is our champion, they cannot, that which is evil, the, the world, the flesh, Satan, death, false teachers, they cannot permanently defeat us. Now that's big news, right? You see, Satan could not ultimately stop Paul, could he? Ultimately. Satan cannot ultimately defeat us. False teachers cannot ultimately cause the demise of the church. Oh, they can interrupt it. And they have at times. Oh, death can put a halt to things temporarily. Now, the truth is, do we serve to have God on our side? Is that why we do what we do? No, that's not why we do what we do. We follow because of who God is. Right? We follow because of what he's done and how he's demonstrated who he is. We don't do it because he's some magic... God and if I do a certain amount of things and so I shake the magic God ball and <sighs> all signs point to God will do something for me. No, it's not like that, is it? He's not some kind of genie. He's the almighty God. He's not like that. He's God. He's better than that. He's bigger than that. But man, this is a big deal still. God has, despite this, always been and always will be for those who are His. That's the point of Romans 8, 28 through 30, right? That's the whole point, that if He has called us, if He has picked us out, if He has chosen us, and He has determined to glorify us, and he is determined to conform us to his image, then he is for us. And that's what Paul is saying here in verse 31. He's like, man, then if that's the point, if God is for us, then look at anything that can be against us. Big deal. What does it really count? Because it's still the almighty God versus that. Stack them all up together. And what are they compared to the Almighty? To the Infinite One. Stack up all your problems today. All of them. How do they compare to Him? Right now, how do they compare? Can He handle them? Can He touch them? Now, I know what you're thinking, but, okay, I know he can handle them, but, but he hasn't yet. Okay, you may be right. He hasn't yet. Because God is infinite in wisdom, right? And he knows the right timing when we don't. But see, the reality is God being for us should give us the understanding that we have nothing to fear. So if we know we have nothing to fear, even in the moment where we're struggling, even in the moment where we're in our struggle, we should recognize some things. And so I want to take you to a few verses. Psalm chapter 27, verse 1, we see these words. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? So understanding that the Lord is my light, understanding the Lord is my salvation, I don't need to fear. The Lord is my the stronghold. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom should I be afraid? Psalm 56 says, 11 
It says, in God I trust. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Okay, we got an election coming up, right? And there's people talking on both sides. Celebrities talking. If this one gets elected, I'm moving to Canada. Well, if this one gets elected, I'm moving to Ireland. I say to both of them, well, if you knew the God I knew, you don't need to fear either of them. Because there's God. And he's bigger than both of them. Oh, sure, they could make life interesting. Both of them could make life really interesting. I'm not arguing that point, okay? I get that. So I'm not disagreeing there that life could change over the next four years. However, I got a really, really big God who is not surprised about what's coming up, regardless of who gets elected in November. Isaiah 40, 28 says, Do you not know, have you not heard? Yahweh is the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never grows faint or weary, and there is no limit. Notice that. No limit to his understanding. So when you get overwhelmed, so when you get past where you can, can comprehend, God is not. That's a big deal, right? That's huge. So you get at that spot where it's like, oh, I'm done. I'm out. He's not. So you go to him. God is for me. Who can be against me? Because God is for me, who do I need to fear? And yet, in this light, because I, I think about what the contrast says, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things. If one is true, what is the antithesis? Think of the grave danger and concern for those whom God may be against. Nahum chapter 2, verse 13. Beware, I am against you. The declaration of the Lord of hosts. I will make your chariots go up in smoke and the sword will devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth and the sound of your messengers will never be heard again. Now, he's making a very distinct declaration against the nation. But these are the kind of things when God is declaring. Jeremiah 50 31, look, I am against you, you arrogant ones. This is the declaration of the Lord God of hosts, because your day has come, the time when I will punish you. Ezekiel 15, 7, I will turn against them. They have escaped from the fire, but it will still consume them. And you will know that I am the Lord when I turn against them. You see, it is a good thing to have God for us, isn't it? I, I give that in, in light as a contrast, uh, not to focus on, because, you see, we want God for us, right? Um, if we belong to him, this isn't something to worry about, right? This is not something to be concerned about. However, if we do not belong to him, what does it mean? If God is not for me, by definition, if God is not for me, he is against me. In fact, Scripture says in the book, same very book of Romans that it, when I am his enemy, he died for me. Now, it does mean he loves me, right? Because he died for me. 
So even while I am his enemy, he's dying for me. He died for me. That's good news. So he does not want this thing that is going to happen to me as his enemy to happen to me. Praise God for that. But the wrath of God will pour out upon me if something doesn't change. If I don't turn to him. Now, as a child of God, back to verse 31 of Romans 8. Back to verse 31. Let's go back to verse 31 and get ourselves back into this Romans 8 verse 31. What are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Well, God continue to give us all things. Look at verse 32. He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? How will he not also with him grant us everything? Now God proves his love. He demonstrates his love. He shows us the kind of love that he has for us by giving his son on our behalf. Now we know the great demonstration of this by a verse that not only the church knows, but the vast majority of our nation knows, the vast majority of the English-speaking world knows, John 3.16. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his own, one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Or the King James says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What a verse, right? What a statement. So often we've, we've heard that verse, and the world has heard that verse so much that it has lost meaning, right? That it has become a, a billboard that you, you write by. It's a shame. Um... It shouldn't. I've been guilty of that. That's what I'll tell you. I won't accuse you of that, but I've been guilty of that in the past, of, of having that verse do that. But, but let's slow it down just briefly. The kind of love that God demonstrates to the world of giving his one and only son. Man, that's huge. I mean, what if I asked Aaron to do that with Gabe? At this moment, right? Gabe just got married. Hey, Aaron, you want to you give Gabe up now on behalf of the whole church? <laughs> right now. I mean, he's just about ready to go on his honeymoon. And, and so the church can keep living. You have to give up Gabe. I mean, that's a big sacrifice at this moment. Everything's starting to go Wow, for Gabe. And now's the time. So that everybody else can keep going. That's the sacrifice. That's huge. I'm not asking, I'm not going to ask you to answer that. But I mean, think about that. That's a that's a sacrifice. I mean, there's Jesus in heaven. Son of God. Very God. He not only has to become flesh, man but he's going to have to die horrid death on the cross so that everyone who believes will not perish but have eternal life. That's... Wow. But Romans 8.32 makes this statement. It says, He did not even spare his own son. He delivered Jesus to the cross. Now, it, it's wild when you start reading because in the book of Acts... We're told in Acts chapter 3 that it was men that did this. And John chapter 10, we're told that it was the Son who chose to go to the cross. 
But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and this is where I want us to go, I, I want you to see how 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this. Because I, it, it's, it's this amazing statement. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21. Ultimately, the Father delivers His Son for the purpose of becoming sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. And in verse 20, it said, We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He, that is God, speaking of the Father, made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's... It wasn't just that he sent him to earth. It wasn't just that he, I mean, th that's what he caused to happen. That's, that's huge. I, I know I say that in Pastor Paul. I, 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 <laughs> it was that moment when you said that, that uh, I think it was last Sunday or something, two Sundays ago. It's like, as Pastor Tom says, that's huge. I'm like, I say that a lot. <laughs> but this is huge. <laughs> it's a big deal right God the Father made Jesus sin for us that's love I don't think we're ever going to understand that kind of love we're never going to get it this side of heaven not, not that kind of love. I mean, we may get father's, uh, a father's love, a mother's love, a brother's love, a husband and wife's love. I mean, but we're not going to get that. <laughs> Sacrificial love, all that. But, but this, this is, you, you can't understand that. I mean, every time we start to get a glimpse, it's like, no, no, no. That's still not, that still doesn't compare. This is what the Father did for us. He took Jesus, God, said, I want you to become a man, and then I want you to take the sins of everybody, the rapist, the serial killer, all of them. I want you to take them all on that cross. Even the ones that aren't even going to ask you to forgive them. I want you to pay for them. Okay, Jesus, that's what I want. You become a sin. And then Jesus did it. That's huge, right? That's, that's the love that the Father proved by giving his son. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.21 demonstrates. That's that love. That's, that's what it means when he says, if he's for us, who can be against us? The father proves his love. God did not spare his own beloved son. That's why in Matthew 27.46, at about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The, the, the man in him, just bearing that, that sin. This is the measure of the Father's love. The separation between the Son and the Father for the first time. I mean, this is why in 1 John 4.10 we see love consists in this, not that we have loved God, not that we have loved Him, but that, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation, the, the propitiation for our sins. I mean, that's, 
That's the deal, right? It's not the, that he sent him to show love to us, to send him to demonstrate. No, to be that propitiation, the, uh, the atonement, the, the payment, the whole package, to become that which we needed. That's what love is. Back to Romans 8. <laughs> the Father proves his love. Will he not then also with him grant us everything? Because God has done this. Greatest possible conceivable good, right? Giving his son for his enemy we can be assured that all other blessings will follow. This is what Paul says. Will he not also with him grant us everything? Now, what does he mean by everything? Well, certainly final salvation, right? Glorification. John 10, 28. Turn your Bibles to John 10, 28. I've been not having you turn very many places. Turn your Bibles to John 10, 28. It's what Jesus says. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish ever, right? Ever. No one will snatch them out of my hands. Now, it's funny because Nazarene church will tell you, well, you can walk out of that hand. The problem is that first part of that verse, right? They will never perish ever. <laughs> There's a problem there, isn't there? Even if you can argue that last, that last part of the verse, you can't argue the first part of the verse. That ever part. The ever is a big issue. <laughs> um, so what do you do with the ever? You can't do anything with that ever. Jesus is being very emphatic there. Now, how do we deal with this? This is not just an eternal body. You could lose your salvation. How do we know? For the, the lake of fire is referred to in Scripture as a second death. This is referred to as an eternal life. That's a, that's a big contrast. There's no mistake there. When one is referred to as a death and one is referred to as an eternal life, you can't argue those two things not going together, can you? If one's life forever and one's death forever, they, they clash, right? There's a contradiction. You can't fit them together. You can't get one from Jesus and then go into a second death. You just can't. Moving on. Now, what, does he, what else might he mean by everything? Certainly Paul had in mind present spiritual needs. He has given us everything necessary for life and godliness. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, we're told, For his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Turn in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And we're told, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. But notice this last part. God is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, he will also provide a way to escape so that you are able to bear it. And so again, God is providing a way to get through. He will give you that way. Even more, he provides earthly needs. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. It says, And God is able to make every grace overflow to you, so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. Notice again, everything you need. Not everything you want. That's always so important. Not everything you think you need, right? That's important. It's like, man, I really think I need a new tablet. Mm. 
everything you really need. Now, we move on from there. Who will bring a charge to condemn God's elect? Moving on to verse 33. Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Now, who are the elect? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says, For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. That is, God chose us, the believers, in him before the foundation of the world. That is, we are the, are the believers chosen. We are the ones who are the elect. Think about that. That is, the elect are the Christians. I know that's that's crazy, right? Um, it seems crazy in this world. This we 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 love freedom. We're, we're America, right? We have our rights. We get to choose everything. We are free. God says you're elect. You're elect. I chose you. I picked you out before the foundation of the world. I've elected you. I chose you. That's what he says, right? I mean, that's what he tells us. That's what he told us earlier, that he predestined, he called. He says it. I'm not going to argue with him. He tells us that. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, there's a, a point where we also are told, whosoever, right? Now... I don't know who made this illustration, and I've heard it so often and for so long that it was probably made hundreds of years ago <laughs> whenever trains were first started, that's my guess. But there's this picture of the train tracks, right? And on one side you have this predestination, on the other side you have free will. And somewhere along the way the train tracks are going, you see it way out in the distance, and the train appears to come together and they meet. And our minds are finite. And you see them way out in the distance where they appear to meet. And God knows how this whole free will thing and predestination and election works. And in his word, he tells us that we, whosoever, wills. And he also tells us that we are called and that he chooses it makes no sense, right? In our minds, it makes no sense. But he tells us both of those things, correct? He tells us that. Absolutely, 100%. Now, either he is telling us the truth, or he's not. You know what I believe? I believe he's telling me the truth. That's what I believe. And I believe somewhere down that train track it meets where God's mind makes sense of it. And my finite mind simply cannot. And God's mind's a whole lot bigger than mine because mine only weighs so many pounds and it fits inside this small, tiny little head. And I'm good with that because my God's a lot bigger than me. A lot bigger. And John Calvin and John Wesley couldn't figure it out. And so they made their theologies... And they're pretty good, but they're finite. I'm okay with that for what they are. And so we move on. We are elect. God has chosen us. He has picked us out before the foundation of the world because his word tells us that. And I will believe him. And scripture goes on and says, who would make an accusation against us now? There's two things we need to make sure we understand. First of all, in the context here, it is talking about God because he is the judge, but there is one other, isn't there, that always is ready to make an accusation. And I do want to address that just for a moment. 
because even today there is one who will accuse, and he even has, bears that name, and his name is Satan. So I do want to address that just for a brief moment, even though it's a little out of context, and I will point that out. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 says, Even now, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah has now come because the accuser of our brethren has been thrown out, the one who accuses before them our God day and night. So that is going on even today because Revelation 12, verse 10 has not occurred. So Satan is up there accusing even now. But we're going to get there. And this is why I want to help us understand because Jesus is there on our behalf interceding. And this is part of why he is interceding, because we do have one accusing. And I think that's why this is important to throw this in there. But who would make an accusation? Because we do have a judge and a God who is there on our behalf, who has already sent one who has paid, who has demonstrated his love for us. Now understand, back to Romans, Christ has removed our condemnation. Think about this. Because the Father has sent him, the one who has judged, the one who has the reason to pass judgment. He has sent the one to pay for sin. And Jesus died for our sin. He became sin. That's what we're told in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Remember, the Father, the one who has right to lay judgment, has actually sent the payment for us. He sent him to become sin for us. And so Jesus died for our sins. He was actually, he, he was payment for our sin, and he was raised by the Father, we're told in Scripture. And now he is at the Father's right hand. His work is finished. He is glorified with the Father. Did I go too far? No, there we are. Oh. I didn't. I went. I jumped a page. Oh well. Sorry. God's judgment is the only one that matters. Because Psalm fifty-one tells us, "Against you and you alone I have sinned, and done this evil in your sight." So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. And that's that's the important aspect we need to understand because it is the Father who is the judge, right? But, and that's why when we get to Christ, that's, that's the part I missed. I apologize to you. I jumped, a sh I jumped a page in my notes. It's kind of important. That's why when I got to Christ and some of you were looking at me, I saw a couple of eyes like, where are you going, Pastor? Hi. I and, and now I got a couple of you looking at me like, what are you doing now? Okay. Not my, bright, not my shining moment here. We'll have that. We're moving on. We're back on page. <laughs> All right. So the father, being the judge, has, has the right. But remember, being the judge and he has the right, he has sent Jesus as payment. And he has the right to do that. And the payment having been made is the, the greatest thing. Because the payment's made. Having died for our sins, raised by the father, the judge himself, is this huge deal. Because now the payment's been made, he is raised by the Father, and he is sitting at the right hand, and his work is finished, and he is glorified with the Father, and is in a position of power, and is in a position of authority, and is now representing us. Think about that. Someone with power and authority representing us. Isn't that what we want if we're in a court of law? One of the things I was told is it's probably one of the dumbest things you want to do is represent yourself in a court of law, right? You probably don't want to do that. And Jesus is now waiting his own final triumph. But while he waits his own final triumph, he is in heaven interceding and advocating for us. 1 John 2.1, we're, 
told these things. Turn your Bibles to 1 John 2. I know it's up there, but if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to it. 1 John 2. My little children, I am writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. That's our advocate. That's our representative. When we fail, when we fall, standing there before the Father, when the accuser makes his accusation, stands the Holy One, Jesus Christ our Messiah, saying, no, my blood covered that one. I've got that. They're mine. Yeah. No, I paid for that one too. Jesus is interceding for you and for me, covering us. He represents all of our interests in heaven. Hebrews 7, 25 says, Therefore he is always able to save those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. Man, this is this should be sweet stuff for us, right? This should be great encouragement. And so we go back to that first verse that we looked at and the question that Paul asked. What shall we say then? What shall we say then? We look at these things, we look at these truths, and we ask ask ourselves, what are we to say about these things if God is for us? Who is against us? John 6.37 says, Everyone the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. If God is for us, who can be against us? I have two challenges that I want to share with you. One, I feel remiss because this is largely a challenge to you as a church if you're part of the body. But I sit here and as I, as I prepared this sermon, I, I struggled because if you're sitting here and you aren't part of the body, it ends up being a real struggle because you, you missed it. And that's why I, I put this verse up here and I think, This could be for you. You could have this. Because he did all this. He became sin, not only for the believer, and and that's what 1 John 2 said, not only for the sins of the body, but also for those of the whole world. And that anyone who comes to Jesus, he will not cast out. So if, you have not, if you're sitting here and you have not given your life to Jesus, if you're sitting here and you have not repented of your sins and turned your life to Jesus, if you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, today is the day to do that. If you don't understand what that means and you don't understand what that looks like, I ask you to come and see me today or I ask you to come and see one of the Christians here today. And ask what that's about. You don't have to see me. There's a lot of people here that know what that looks like. And you can ask them. But don't leave here today without finding out. To the body. When you know this is true. That if God is for you, 
And who can be against you? When you know this is true, that God has done these things for you, that he has done this on your behalf, that Jesus is up there standing, representing you, then the question I keep struggling with is, so how are you living? What are you doing with what he's done? I mean, we've seen verses 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, and then he goes on. And this is what I want to close with, is what he goes on with. This is where the challenge really comes. It was supposed to be right there. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or anguish or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than victorious through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that not even death or life, angels or rulers, things of present or things to come, hostile powers, height or depth, or any other created thing will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I know that, Christian, if I were to ask you if you believe that was true, I'm sure you would shake your head yes. Are you practicing that? Are you practicing the truth of that? Because Paul says there in, in verse 36, as it is written, because of you we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Are you doing things that would challenge your faith? Are you doing things that would cause your faith to move? So the challenge is for you to move. Because if we just sit here, nothing's going to happen. If we just sit here, we're just going to be here. There's a world that needs Jesus. There's a city that needs Jesus. We are more than conquerors. God is for us. Who can be against us? Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. It's time to move. Let's pray. Our God, we come to you. We know that you're for us. We know these things are true. None of this is new information. But Lord, we need you to stir us up. We need that fire to well up. We need these truths, these words to just stir us up in our heart. Holy Spirit, move us. Stir us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.